Welcome to the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Chair Chat. I am Lacey Durham, Chair of the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. I want to welcome you to this special installment called Perfecting Democracy, a leadership discussion series on voting rights and election protection. Today, we are honored to welcome Mr. Damian Hewitt, President and CEO of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. He leads one of the nation's leading civil rights legal organization and, and the country's largest nonpartisan voter protection coalition that many of you have heard about, election protection. Election protection is an initiative that works year round to address barriers to voting, especially for traditionally disenfranchised communities. As we approach the 2025 election cycle, Damien and his team of legal experts remain committed to using advocacy within and outside the courts to advance racial justice and ensure that the most marginalized people have a voice, an opportunity, and the power to make the promises of democracy a reality. Dr. Cynthia Swan, who will moderate today's session, is also the secretary of the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. She also is the chair of the Section's Perfecting Democracy Initiative, which aims to recruit lawyers and law students to support nonpartisan efforts to protect fair elections and voting rights at all levels. She also serves as the Chief Administrative Officer of the Hip Hop Caucus Education Fund. This organization harnesses cultural expression to empower communities most affected by injustice. For over 16 years and across seven election cycles, the Hip Hop Caucus has mobilized hundreds of thousands of young BIPOC voters throughout their award-winning Respect My Vote campaign, fighting against voter suppression and advocating for election reforms. It is truly my honor and my pleasure to introduce both Damien and Dr. Swan. Damien, it is a wonderful opportunity and a pleasure for me to have you here with us at the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Perfecting Democracy initiative, the work that we're doing in order to make certain that lawyers are engaged in the voting rights, voter suppression, voter protection efforts that are happening, along with the broader civil rights issues. But today we're focusing on voting rights. To our audience, Damon Hewitt is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Damon and I have been in the trenches together over many years. He has an extensive background in policy and litigation and philanthropy and through many public sectors. And we are going to start this conversation today on the issues that we know are facing our democracy as we're going into the upcoming election and beyond. And Damon, thank you for being here with us. And we are very thankful, very thankful for you being here and realize that it's a pleasure to be able to get to you when you have so many things that are happening in your world around voting rights at this time. Well, thank you uh, for having me. It's great to be with you. And thank you for getting the word out uh, to the membership and to attorneys nationwide uh, about uh, what's at stake and what they can do about it. Absolutely, absolutely. So I want to start off with just finding you know, an opportunity to kind of set the landscape in terms of where we are now and, and how we begin to position ourselves to move to the next level. So in your view, what is the most critical role that attorneys play uh, in protecting democracy, particularly in safeguarding voting rights and the rule of law as we protect the 20, as we approach the 2025 elections? Sure. Well, you know, um, I will give you a, an analogy to uh, astrophysics. Uh, you know, astrophysicists say that the universe is constantly expanding and getting larger and more uh, co co complex. I like to think of democracy as ever expanding, growing in terms of who's included, in terms of how one can access and participate in democratic process. Unfortunately, uh, even though democracy does work when we let it, uh, a lot of people aren't letting it. Uh, there are so many uh, efforts afoot to suppress votes, 
to suppress voters, to uh, make sure that people, if they won't vote a certain way, that they get kicked off the rolls altogether. And so there's some people who think it's to political advantage uh, that fewer people actually vote. So democracy isn't expanding in the ways that it naturally, in my view, should. Uh, and so what's so important is that we, as members of the private bar, can stand up. You know, the Lawyers Committee was founded in 1963 at a meeting convened by President John F. Kennedy, just nine or so days after Governor George Wallace of Alabama stood in the schoolhouse door to block racial integration, obstructing justice, obstructing a federal mandate. And also just days after Mega Evers, the Mississippi Field Secretary for the NAACP was assassinated in the driveway of his own home. Around that time, President Kennedy called for legislation, which will become the Civil Rights Act of 64, but he also called a meeting of lawyers who came to the White House in the East Room and got themselves into the work and into the game. And what you saw were you know, folks from various law firms around the country, but also folks from the private bar, from ABA chapters all around the country. Uh, and they were there to answer the call, to really enforce the rule of law and the mandate, uh, not just in the any political party, because it was completely nonpartisan. It was really about the rule of law itself, uh, to really make sure that the nation's civil rights laws were upheld. Uh, and the voting law rights laws that we would uh, find and, and, and obtain two years later with the Voting Rights Act of 65, that they were upheld. You know, lawyers committee, uh, lawyers and members of the bar in the ABA were instrumental in drafting parts of the Voting Rights Act and then later in enforcing it all of these years. So really standing up for the rule of law and enforcing civil rights protections are just so important. And that's where we come in. Uh, you know, there are movements in activism in streets and in communities, but there's also a movement in the courts. And that's why the ABA and the private bar are so important. We are the, what I like to call the peaceful army of private attorneys general to enforce those laws. Well, that brings me to asking at this point, how has the legal profession currently been responding to challenges like voter suppression and election security in recent election cycles and what more can be done leading into 2025? Obviously the lawyers committee has been a leader in this work. Um, you are working with us on perfecting democracy and making certain that lawyers are getting trained and prepared. You're working with frontline communities and organizations like the one that I work for, the Hip Hop Caucus uh, Education Fund, who is focused on young voters um, in that demographic. But how has the legal profession responded to the challenges of voter suppression and election security? recently and especially going into 2025 when we have so many feeling disenfranchised and deciding perhaps I won't vote at all because I don't I'm not sure it's going to matter so what are we doing well you know great question Dr. Swan you know members of the private bar have uh, really stepped up in so many different ways for one uh, so many have volunteered for election protection in the 2020 election cycle uh, we had 14,000 attorneys volunteer to participate in the Election Protection Coalition, specifically the 866 Our Vote Hotline and, of course, sister hotlines that are in many languages. This year will feature availability in 12 different languages, uh, which is the most ever, uh, to make sure that when voters call the hotline, 866 Our Vote or its sister hotlines in other languages, that they actually talk to an attorney. And they talk to an attorney who's been recruited and trained and deployed by us and our, our colleagues and comrades so that voters have the best uh, possible advice uh, from a, a real live attorney. Uh, and so, you know, what, what's really important is that when you answer the call, figuratively, so to speak, uh, that you're all in. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing more important than to have someone's, you know, rights or life or liberty in your hands. And so this isn't uh, life or death, literally, but it is figuratively in the sense that we want to make sure that voters get the best possible advice. So having 14,000 attorneys volunteer in 2020 was epic. We certainly expect, you know, uh, you know, if not that number, something close to it, uh, this go round uh, in this election season, which begins now, frankly, it's not just election day. It really does begin now. That's a really chief way. And I'd say going into 2025, what's important is to do more of that protection. You know, 
uh, people think about election day uh, or early voting in the election season, but it's what happens in between elections that's so important because Dr. Swan, that's when the most important and dangerous threats actually come up. They actually come up in voter suppression schemes and mass challenges that uh, to voter eligibility that happened well before election day. And so attorneys can play a significant role standing up against that. I would also say just in the general discourse, it's important to be vocal. Uh, there are so many people who want to shrink democracy, as I alluded to earlier. What we'd love to see is people not just encouraging people to vote, which is important, but to mainstream the importance of defending the right to vote. That should be part of our public consciousness. That should be part of our mandate. That should be part of what the bar is active in every day, 365 days a year. Absolutely. I agree with you. And so if we think about the role of our, our state bars, we also want to talk about the roles that the ABA would play. So what role do legal institutions broadly, such as the ABA, what role do they have in advocating for strong election protection and ensuring that voting rights remain a priority in 2025? And to your point, as we move on, because we know that the um, general election is important, right. but state and local elections are critical if we're going to make anything happen in this country that is significant and that understands and recognizes the concerns of the constituents in those respective states. So what do you see that legal institutions such as ours should be doing, maybe that we aren't doing or that we need to do more of? Well, you all do so much already. We just have to keep that energy, as they say, uh, and, and keep things going. Uh, obviously, things peak during a major election, election cycle, but we want uh, to sustain that peak, uh, so to speak. Uh, and I, I would say helping to Number one, volunteer for the, the election protection hotline is important. Helping to do something else. You know, we don't do get out the vote uh, at our organization. Some groups do that, but we do get out the message. And I think the ABA and state bars can play a significant role in getting out the message. Not so much about politics, but get out the message about here are your rights. Here are the things that you can expect when you go to the polls. Here's how you make a plan to vote. And if you have any questions or encounter any problems, Here's the hotline to call, 866-OUR-VOTE. Mm -hmm. There's really no reason through all the networks that we all have that the hotline for election protection shouldn't be ubiquitous. Everybody should have access to that as a resource if they want it uh, and if they need it especially. And so we can certainly you know, see a significant role for state bars and the ABA itself to help in getting out that message. Okay, and I think also if you could talk to us about what role can pro bono attorneys, what role can they play? As we talk right. about, you know how once the election is over, the election is not over. And right. so we know that we need our pro bono attorneys to be on, on alert, be prepared, be engaged. But tell us more about the role that they could actually play and how they can become engaged and ready to be involved post-election, should there be any challenges? Sure. Well, at the Lawyers Committee, along with our sister organizations, we've been gearing up uh, actually for a few years now and all this year for this election cycle. There's really three critical periods. There's right now, we're involved in active litigation trying to beat back voter purges in states like Georgia, uh, where we've, we have filed two different uh, actions and also in North Carolina, where we're defending an action where private actors are trying to kick eligible voters off the rolls, trying to call into question, call into doubt their bona fides to be able to vote uh, for political advantage. That's really important. And we don't do those cases alone. We work with law firms and lawyers in the private bar. That's that's really important. Uh, I say, secondly, you know, election protection is pro bono. Uh, law firms uh, can and do and should give billable hours credit. Uh, if you're at a, a, a fee generating uh, type of firm, not a nonprofit, uh, for your volunteering for election protection, it's only two hours of training and a four hour shift at a time. We encourage multiple shifts, uh, but it, it is very sustainable. And then you mentioned Dr. Swan post election. In the 2020 cycle, we helped to defend against 15 different lawsuits that were filed after election day 
where people were trying to manipulate the state court processes in various states to try to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 presidential election. With the kind of lawfare that we're seeing right now already, uh, well before election day, I think we can expect more of the same. Uh, we also at the Lawyers Committee, unfortunately, had to uh, take act legal action after the January 6th insurrection. Uh, we are suing a number of uh, individual actors, many of whom have been convicted and sentenced for their role, uh, and also some entities like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, uh, groups that were, we have alleged, actively in conspiracy to violate civil rights, uh, to drown out uh, not just the process of the day of certification of votes, but also drown out the voice, uh, voices of so many voters around the country in an election in which an historic number of people, uh, including people of color who are often disenfranchised, turned out to vote. Uh, so we need pro bono lawyers in all phases of this process. Right now, during the registration uh, period, uh, during early voting and election day, and also after the election as well, there's ample litigation to be involved in with us and our allies. I am, okay. a, big fan. I am a big fan of um the fact that we need to engage our senior lawyers um, as well as our young lawyers and law students to have them fully engaged and 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 uh, understanding the role that they can play at this stage of the game as close as we are to 2025 but understanding that we need this work done 365 days a year um could you give some advice that you would give to young lawyers specifically or law students about their role in defending voting rights, election integrity, and democracy as a whole at this point as they're seeing our country begin to understand um, the importance of, of, of paying close attention to our democracy and the path that it could lead. You know, the civil rights movement itself has always been at its heart uh, not only multiracial, but also intergenerational. And so we really need that continuity of effort, of mission, of strategy, of execution across uh, generations. And I would say to our, uh, you know, earlier career uh, attorneys, uh, your energy and insights are, are vitally important. You know, the way we reached voters when we started election protection at our organization, uh, when, when we became part of it uh, 20 years ago, you know, is different than how we do it now. The way we reach people is different. You know, it's not just a hotline anymore. There's also online, there's a text to chat, uh, there's a short code. You can text my vote instead of calling 866-OUR-VOTE. Uh, uh, you know, there's WhatsApp, right? So there's the various platforms and ways to engage. Uh, and I think that, you know, early career attorneys have a pulse and an insight uh, to what, you know, so many are thinking. And it's really important because we know there are millions uh, historic numbers of millions more people who are now of voting age who were not of voting age during the last presidential election cycle. And so those are people who haven't had a chance yet uh, in full to be chronic voters. Uh, we hope they will be, uh, but people who are really getting their first taste of what it looks like to participate in this part of democracy. And so seeing our early career lawyers in action, knowing what's important to them, that they're more proximate to the, the, the younger voters, I think that just makes a, a huge difference. It is a type of uh, role modeling uh, that whether it's formal or informal, that matters. Uh, you know, people like, like me who are knocking off 50 or above, they, they may look up to us, uh, but they don't necessarily, they're not as proximate to us. And so I think that seeing that it's not just something for elder folks or later career uh, individuals, I think, is really important and sends a really strong message that voting is for everyone and protecting and defending the vote is also for everyone. And Damon, I thank you for all of that and understanding that we have talked about lawyers and the role that we have and we, we, we that we play in this process. But for those who are trying to just understand the basics, could you mm -hmm. just give the elevator speech, if you will, in terms of what exactly are we fighting against when you talk about 
uh, voter security issues when you mm -hmm. talk about disinformation. What right. when they say what am I what am I fighting? What are you telling right. me the issues are that I need to get more engaged in? Um, right. Touched on a couple of them, but could you mm -hmm. kind of like do a very quick deep dive into what we're talking about about election insecurity, AI, a number of different things that are coming into this process at this time? Of course. So. In states like North Carolina and Georgia, and even Texas, there are mass voter challenges. These are efforts to purge the rolls, uh, quite often targeting voters who may or may not vote a certain uh, way for a candidate or party. So there's certainly partisan aims to this, uh, these types of challenges, mass challenges to kick people off the rolls. Now we know under the federal uh, National Voter Registration Act, NVRA or the Motor Voter Law, as some call it, that that's not something that should be permitted within 90 days of an election. Uh, but there's some private actors who are trying to force the issue in state courts primarily right now, trying to frankly avoid and evade uh, the uh, prevailing federal law. And so we're fighting against those mass challenges in all the states that I mentioned right now. Uh, so that's a live battle. Uh, there are also efforts uh, to uh, challenge certification. We're involved in litigation in Georgia in particular, where there are some who are suggesting that certifying the vote count is discretionary, not mandatory, trying to leave room uh, for folks to, you know, cause mayhem at the end of the process, uh, which really, you know, could tend to dilute or even deny uh, people's voices and votes uh, from really being heard and counted in a proper way. And you mentioned AI, you know, the Security Election Protection Hotline will receive all types of concerns and complaints. One of the uh, types of calls we received in 2020 were about uh, robocalls that were spreading disinformation through an orchestrated campaign. Uh, a caller uh, reported that they heard someone say on a robocall something to the effect of, did you know if you vote by mail that the information will be used against you by creditors to collect outstanding debts? that it will be used by police to execute outstanding warrants, and that it will be used by the Centers for Disease Control to force mandatory vaccinations. At the end, the robocaller says, don't give your information to the man. What we learned was that some individuals hired a black woman as a voice actor to record this call, and at the calls, 85,000 of them were targeted towards black voters, trying to play to senses of precarity and insecurity in black communities about uh, concerns about economic uh, insecurity, uh, concerns about uh, mass incarceration and police brutality, concerns about uh, harkening back to the infamous Tuskegee experiment. Uh, we were able to address that by using Section 11B of the Voting Rights Act, which addresses efforts at intimidation of voters uh, that by private actors. And so we won that lawsuit. We were able to get a preliminary injunction during the early voting period in 2020, and then later won the case on summary judgment, uh, New York Attorney General Letitia James intervened on our behalf on our side of the case and joined us with respect to New York voters. Together, we were able to secure a judgment of up to $1.3 million for clients, but also set a new precedent because this was a first of its kind case uh, where Section 11B had been used with respect to robocalls. You fast forward to the New Hampshire primary, presidential primary, where there was some documented instances of voice cloning of President Biden. And then we realized that, you know, if you use the toaster to make breakfast this morning, that toaster is more regulated than artificial intelligence. Because products liability is strict liability. There's an entire legal statutory and regulatory regime. We don't have that yet for AI. At the Lawyers Committee, we've rolled out what we call our Online Civil Rights Act. It's a model bill that would address the harms that AI can cause in the voting context and law enforcement and justice and other contexts as well. And so we've been shining a spotlight on this, standing ready to sue, but also you know, pushing for some type of regulatory regime so that we don't have to sue individual instances so that there will be a national standard that stops the spread of disinformation through AI or any other means. So the stakes are very high. These are real life examples of real things that are happening. These are not conjecture or abstract. Uh, and they can cause this mayhem on the cheap. It doesn't cost a lot of money to file a frivolous lawsuit to, to try to purge voters. All you need is somebody who's not living up to the calling uh, of our oath as attorneys 
to actually uh, try to manipulate the law in that way. You don't need a lot of money to set up robocalls. These private actors did that for less than $10,000. They sent messages to 85,000 voters until we stopped them. And so we're playing whack-a-mole and catch-up until we can get better and stronger laws in place, which is why we need the bar in full force. Tens of thousands of attorneys trying and pushing hard together to do the right thing in the interest of justice. Okay, well, I think that um, I, and I don't think, I know for a fact that you and, and, and the lawyers committee and your team over there have been partners in this work um, for a number of years and you are definitely uh, who we turn to um, with our training and the training that we're doing here at the ABA with the perfecting democracy work that we're doing um, lawyers are being um, uh, directed to your program because we know that that's where they'll get the training and the preparation that they need um, as attorneys, but also as on the ground advocates to be wherever they need to be. Would you say that uh, Georgia, Texas, Florida, and what other, other what other states would you say would be the primary states where you would like for us and for others to focus? Sure. Uh, Pennsylvania um, is, is another uh, state, uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, all, all of our people, all of our states are important, but these are states where we're seeing uh, some of the lawfare, the strategic uh, activity to try to cause mayhem uh, right now. Uh, and there's also other states, uh, especially throughout the Deep South, where voter suppression bills were introduced and uh, signed into law. Uh, around 2021 or, or shortly thereafter. Those are the type of states uh, that are either quote unquote swing states where the partisan battles are so vicious that voters are being caught in the middle or states where there's such an oppressive regime for voter suppression already in place. And some people are now voting for the first time in a presidential race, right? Uh, since those laws came into effect in 2021 and 2022. So those are the kind of places, you know, we cover through the election protection campaign, there are about three dozen states that have active state level operations for election protection that are supported by us at the national level. And at the lawyers community, we deploy and send uh, direct resources, uh, staffing and otherwise to folks in 14 different states. So all the ones we mentioned and even more are critically important to ensuring that every voice is heard and that every vote is counted and remains counted. Well, Damon, I cannot thank you enough for all the work that you're doing. I cannot thank you enough for the work that you're doing working with, with us at the ABA and the Perfecting Democracy um, initiative and project that we have. I also want to extend a great thank you to you for what you do working with frontline communities. Um, your organization, yes, you make certain that attorneys are prepared and understand the role. And this, yes. this uh, webinar is going to work uh, for that. This share chat is gonna work mm -hmm. for that. But right. you also make absolutely certain that our uh, frontline communities, that those who have to understand that they have a role, that they go into election day and on election day feeling prepared to do the work. And so I know that those that I work with at the Hip Hop Caucus Education Fund and so many others are extremely thankful to you to your organization for the work that you do. And so thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. Your time. And I look forward to us meeting on meeting in the trenches yet again. I do. Dr. Swan, before you go, there's one more component I, I want to mention since you you mentioned Hip Hop Caucus and the work that you and, and so many great colleagues do around the country. We're talking directly to lawyers now, uh, but lawyers are whole people too. And uh, you know, through election protection, through a66ourvote.org, which is the, the website, uh, attorneys can sign up to volunteer for election protection, uh, but you can also sign up to do poll monitoring if you're an attorney or not. Uh, okay. And so I, I want to share with the audience a sub campaign, a new part of the election protection campaign that we introduced this year called Oho Ashe, Black Women Answering the Call. Uh, the purpose of the campaign is to recognize the important contributions that Black women like yourself have made to protecting the right to vote as something of the tip of the spear of protecting democracy. Uh, you know, as a multiracial uh, organization focused on 
the black community trying to build a multiracial democracy, we understand that there's a centrality that so many different communities have to this work and black women really are answering the call. So the campaign is designed to do two things. One, recruit and deploy black women as pool monitors to protect democracy in real time in our own communities, but also to give black women their flowers for what they do. And so Dr. Swan, I wanna give you your virtual flowers for all the work that you've been doing over the years in such deep partnership at the Hip Hop Caucus and also before and beyond through the, the ABA and other organizations, you have been among the leaders. And so thank you for what you've done and continue to do. Thank you so much, Damon. I appreciate that. Right. 